Understand that arguments aren't always meant to be won. So there's a, a trap of thinking that there can only be one on top of the mountain. And if that is true, then that's a very lonely place to be. And arguments, in my view, are an opportunity to create understanding. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. You are a, a board certified Texas trial lawyer that has gone viral on social media <laughs> with your daily messages of inspiration, building confidence, how to deal with touchy situations and conversations, arguments, how to deal with unpleasant human beings, yeah. and how to stay calm and peaceful and create amazing outcomes in conversations. That's right. And I'm curious, with all of your experience as a trial lawyer, where was the time that you were the most in the stickiest situation in a trial where you thought there's no way I'm going to get out of this or we're not going to win this case because I'm just, I don't have the skill set or it's not going our way. Right. And what did that teach you about how to be more prepared for yes. future cases? Mm. As, so one of my first trials that I had, it was the first one by, by myself. Often in the legal world, you have like an associate, you have a partner. Yeah, somebody who's with you. And that was the first one by myself. And this was a larger case. Um, and when you get there, there's this perception, especially when you're young, you know, you, you, you're, the, the, the ink on your signature card isn't, on your bar card isn't dry yet. Uh -huh. they, they can smell the green on yeah. it. Yeah. You have no clue what you're doing. No. Yeah. And you, you can feel that pressure because most of the time, even when you're, I am 26, 28, I'm younger than my client. And so there's like, it, it, but that just happens. He doesn't have confidence in you. Yeah. Right, right. It's just so there's that, that level of trust. They, I mean, I know I'm going to be doing it. And it was a full panel. You have different juries depending on what court it's in. There's like county courts that are six, different constitutional courts, being a, a court of 12. That's a typical panel what you see on TV. And so this was panel of 12. Yeah, panel of 12. And it was a, a larger case. The other side had two attorneys on it from a bigger firm. And they were the ones that were like suit and tie, looked clean. And they were, you put, it was, it ended up working out for me that way. But I got in the stitchy, sticky situation when I was talking with a witness and I was crossing this witness and I started to get like really defensive. I started to let what they were saying get after me. You have these difficult witnesses. Who, this wasn't your witness. This was not the my other, witness. Yeah, this yeah. was an expert uh, on the other side. So okay. these are people who are paid obscene amounts of money from the other side to testify on an expert opinion. But this guy was, he was a veteran. I mean, oh, he, he knew what to say. He knew, oh, he, he, he just, he chewed me up like the finest <laughs> piece of state, man. I mean, he was, he, he, he got me good. But what I took away from that, that was just day one, was, <laughs> that was just day one. I ended up winning the trial, okay. but it was because I didn't allow myself. So we did a second day. It's the second time for him to go on the stand. Oh, wow. And the next day I did something different. I aligned my thoughts of how I wanted to approach the situation before I even got in it. I didn't Give do that the example. first day. What does that mean? Yeah. So typically at what we do in every day, we're just going by the seat of our pants. Or you, you're just in it. You, it's easy to get overwhelmed. It's easy to get in that moment. And all of a sudden, you're just kind of surviving in the conversation. So you're looking for different ways to maybe hurt somebody, to have a zinger. To defend to, yourself. You got it. Yeah. yeah, very much so. And I remember getting in my car going, I can't do that again. I can't do that again. And I started coming up with different phrases that I would tell myself to help align me in the moment. When he does this again, when I get defensive you again, got it. when I get triggered and he says something that I know isn't cool, but yes. he's trying to get under my skin, how am I going to respond? You, you got it. You got it. And so there was this need for me being on my own. There was no, I, I didn't have any other people from the firm with me of trying to prove myself. And sometimes when we had that pressure on, there's that need to overpromise, overdo, and you end up you know, what you say, trying to look cute, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, and yeah. You, you overextend yourself. Yeah. And this time I wasn't going to do that. So I started to write things on the top of my yellow notepad to kind of just like make sure I, I sunk these things into my brain. I'd say, 
uh, one that was just like, just be Jefferson. Don't worry about trying to be some, you know, macho court attorney on TV that they just, just be you, just be you. And, and who Jefferson is, is a guy that I hear somebody get defensive. I go, okay. You know, just <laughs> like, oh, all right. And I just, I just bought off a duck's back. And so it was that first step that now all of a sudden his snarkiness, when I got defensive, justified him getting more snark. Oh, right. Yeah. They just ratchet like, it. Like, I got you. Every time. We dig it any you deeper. Got it. But me just going, well, okay. Like al- allowing him to have his moment, it made him look worse. So right. he, he, yeah, because now he looked like the jerk. Now he started to lose credibility. And now the, the scales begin to tip. And when the other side begins to object more, it looks like they're trying to hide something more. And so I took the strategy of here I am fighting for my client, just me. And here he is. They're the ones in the suits. They're the ones with money. They're the ones that are objecting. What does that say? Wow, that's smart. Yeah. So it, and, and so what they would do is they would have, they bring in their paralegals, like their team, and bring in all these boxes. And they wouldn't do it themselves. Papers and everything else. Yeah, yeah. They had these banker boxes, Redwells, and they wouldn't do it themselves. The attorneys wouldn't. They would have their staff do it. I wasn't going to do that. So I made sure the jury, I would keep my box in the hallway until the jury got there. And so I would have two boxes and let the jury see me carry my two heavy boxes in and put them down myself. Wow. And so I just wanted them to always think that which one looks more credible, which one looks more authentic to, you know, their practice. Who cares about the case? Yeah. Exactly. And all of a sudden, because these jurors are just looking at us, I mean, they don't have anything else better to do in the day. I mean, they're given their civic duty. It's amazing. But when they sit in that chair... It's, it's, you're the show for them. And you've got to present a compelling case and you've got to yeah. persuade, influence, and enroll people in a story of your truth. Right. You, I, it is my job to tell my client's truth, my, tell my client's story. And it's just an odd profession because I, Lewis, I get hired to handle other people people's problems right. with people that I don't have a problem with. Okay? <laughs> I, I don't have any problem with them, but I guess I do now. And then to make it worse, the other side hires an attorney whose sole job is to make me look bad, to solely just to uh, make me lose. And you have a judge that just decides the rest. Right. And there's, I mean, every call that you have with opposing counsel, every time you're talking to a judge, you're having to cross-examine a witness, it is... You can see why the profession is very well suited for people that are good at dealing with communication. Yes. Yeah, because if, if you can't, it's, it's not the one for you. What I'm hearing you say is the is now when you go into a case, you have an intention. Yes. When the worst case scenario happens, how am I going to respond? I'm going to just be Jefferson or I'm going to have these other right mantras or whatever you want to call them intentions to remind myself to lean into that is that what i'm hearing you say you got it and i translate that with my clients so i have just like i do it i have to train them and in going in the hot seat not to get defensive not you got to be active they're right. gonna do this they're gonna get under you, your skin they're yes. gonna call you a liar you got it and and because your case might depend solely on how you behave isn't that interesting it, it, it doesn't matter if if you were actually right or wrong. It's how you behave you and your it. energy being presented to a jury. A- absolutely. And that is happening in real life in everyday conversations, yes. in your career, you got it. your relationships, other opportunities of life is how you present yourself. And, uh, a thousand percent. It doesn't matter if you actually have the skills, the credibility, yes. the credentials right. to get the great opportunities. It's how you present the skills, credentials, and credibilities to the person or people in front of you. Right. And my client could have all the facts in their favor, but if they're a jerk, your case is over. Wow. It's not going to happen. It doesn't matter if you broke the law or you didn't break the law. Yeah. It's how you present your situation. It, well, there's some aspect of it that an appellate court might come back and say, oh, we're okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the law is, but when it comes right, to right, jury right. trials, when it comes to jury trials, especially civil, criminal law is different, but on the civil side of things, 
they can dump your case if they just don't like They just don't it. like you. We don't want this person to win. Yeah, b- because if somebody who, uh, here's here's an example. So I had a, a case I was on the defense of, and a lady had been hurt in an accident, and I knew very much that she was, she acted like she was A-OK, and that's OK, because you you can be hurt in an accident and turn out to be fine later. That's There's nothing wrong with that. But what she had done was overextended herself by saying that the accident kept her from holding her grandkids. Oh, the on. accident kept her from being able to go hike and, mm-hmm. and enjoy all these things. Yeah, she milked it. She milked it bad. And so when that kind of happens, it's uh, what I do is just lean back, like, okay, now now she's saying something. Now she's giving me something aside from her facts uh, that I can I can use. And what she didn't even think about was she had posted all these pictures photos on publicly, Instagram, yeah, publicly yeah. of holding grandbabies. They had gone on like three vacations to Hawaii. Like Her on these, top of a mountain. That's yeah. Exactly. It's exactly what it was next to like some like Mount Summit. Okay. And that next day I come in and it's my turn to cross examine. And I said, Miss So and so, I heard you say something the other day that, well, almost broke my heart. You said that life's just not worth living. That, did I read that right? And she says, yes, that's correct. Waterworks start wow. coming up again. All right. She cried both times. Which there's nothing wrong with crying. That's not what I'm saying. But she she manufactured those very quickly. I said, there's some things I want us to look. And take the photos out. You did not have the photos. Case gone. Oh gone my god. In, in a matter of seconds. And it was my client who caused the accident. But her case was it oh, showed that man. Yeah. But it was it was not a, a major accident. But the issue was once you lose your credibility, you cannot and in that sense, you cannot get it back. Wow. And so if she had just stayed true to who she was and been honest of, no, we've been able to go on vacations and do some things, but this accident really caused me some pain back then. And I'm just looking for a way to try and do X, Y, and Z. But she, she got out of that. She got out of that line. Wow. That's funny, man. That's crazy. It's fun. It's fun stuff. <laughs> now, when you're thinking about questioning or examining someone, um, what is the psychology that you think about before you ask the first question to set someone up, whether they're on your team or someone you're going against, I guess, in court, to set them up for the outcome you want to create? What's the psychology you think about in order to get the result in any conversation? So I'm going to answer that in two two spots. Is one, if if it's somebody I am against, all right, versus somebody who's with me. The one against is more fun. So I know that when I sit down and I'm going to depose a witness, meaning I'm asking them questions prior to trial. Yes. They're not going to like me. They know that. They, they think I'm the, the bad guy because they don't know. They just know what they hear on TV. And I know right away that the person that I see is not the person that I'm talking to what we're about to exchange in that moment is they're going to reveal to me conflict that is just going to be a window into the struggle that they're feeling in that moment. That there are things that they carried into that room that they were carrying days, months, hours before they even saw me. And that is probably one of the number one keys of when you deal with these very difficult conversations is the the issue they put up is rarely the real issue. It's, it's, it's not that it's, I mean, you can say something at, even at home, you know, you get an argument with, with a spouse or a girlfriend and you're going, where's this coming from? Well, it turns out, you know, at eight eight o'clock that morning, somebody had cut them off in traffic and they had a bad email and they, and there it goes. They're just frustrated. Their mom said something and you just happen to be the outlet. So that's the ability to recognize that and use that as a place to connect rather than a place to continue to to, um, you know, flare up. How do you use that, whether it's someone personal in your life or someone that you're working with in court, Yeah. when you know it's not who they are, it's the baggage they're carrying to that conversation or the portrayal of the baggage or whatever, how do you use it to your advantage as opposed to get defensive and guarded? Yeah. Whether it's your wife, right, right. a friend, or someone in trial. Sometimes you have to take them outside, like, of of, of their, their their head. So, if you and I are in talking in here, 
and say we get in an argument, we're just here in this room. We take out a step outside. And then you get some perspective. Right. Then you have some clarity. What do we say when we get overwhelmed? I, I need some space. I need to I need to go take a walk. It's the same way when we're having a conversation. You know, I, I can have if I sense something that in that moment I can do one of two things. I can either react, meaning I can get defensive, or I can respond. Responding is a way that says, I'm trying to understand you. Reaction says, I have no say in it. I, you have the cause, I, this is the effect, and that has no accountability in that. Responding says, I'm taking full accountability for my feelings that only I can touch. Yeah. That's, that's the big difference. Wow. How do you not get triggered emotionally, though, in life? Like, personally, if someone's coming at you or attacking you or making you wrong, how do you keep your cool and not get defensive and take things personally? Or do you? It's very natural to take things personally, but what I say before I want to take things personally is I'll say, I'll say, put it down, Jefferson. I'll say, put it down. Most of the time when we're taking something personally, we're picking something up that nobody asks us to carry. And we're just choosing to hold on to it, choosing to say, this was meant for me. And that's not always the case. And too many times we get, somebody says, why are you taking this so personally? And they turn around, we're holding it all. Like, well, why are you holding that? I didn't ask you to hold any of that. So you, you, you get in a position to where the, how personal you take something is a direct reflection of how much grace you give other people. And if I start to take things too personally, oh, well, somebody's just going slow in front of me on purpose. Uh, they're showing up late because they want to show a sign to me. It's just all these different ways of treating things negatively. For the most part, we take it personally. And that, that's, you just drop it. Drop that thought because you're not giving them enough grace. When did you learn to let things go and put things down? Did you have this calm about you as a kid or did something over time help you realize, oh, okay, I don't, I don't need to hold on to this baggage or stress? Right. It, it's just been a, as if it's a just blacksmith hitting on a piece of hot metal, man. I just, my whole life has been that from. Really? Yeah. From my upbringing, a lot of attorneys in the family. I'm the oldest for, I love being the big brother. That meant I had to do a lot of mediating with siblings, a lot of, I mean, I, I was the kid in the corner who just got to hear all the courtroom stories. And so they would teach you how to project and how to present and how to persuade and how to at pace. I mean, it was, it was awesome. And that just kind of translated with what, what I like. Some people are really good at math or economics or accounting. Not me. <laughs> this, this, this is, this is my thing. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I think a lot of people in today's world want to be great at winning arguments. What would you say if you wanted to win an argument? would be the three keys to set yourself up for success? Number one would be understand that arguments aren't always meant to be won. So there's a, a trap of thinking that it, there can only be one on top of the mountain. And if that is true, then that's a very lonely place to be. And arguments, in my view, are an opportunity to create understanding. It's okay to have conflict. Uh, you and I can argue about something, but when it gets negative, that's when it's bad. You and I could argue of who's the best baseball team. And, you know, that's a disagreement that ratchets up a little bit more, becomes an argument. Maybe we get a little bit more passioned. Sure. But number one is that don't get into the trap of thinking that you have to win it. Because when you do, it just it's only going to breed contempt because it comes at a cost. And maybe you made fun of them. Maybe you said something that was, you know, too final, too close to the to the best. So number two is know what the end goal is. Oftentimes we get into this argument and what happens, we're like 10 minutes into it and we go, how do we start this? How did we even get here? What, what were we arguing about right, in the first right, place? Right, 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 right. And that meant that it wasn't real. Most of the time when that happens, it means that the true issue you were arguing about was just a red herring. It's just a surface. So it's, it, it 
have to know where you're going to go in the argument. So what, what the final outcome is. And number two, how are you going to heal it? Because if it's an issue of, especially emotion, if you don't heal it in a way that is going to continue to create that, that positive understanding and interaction, you, you will, you will lose every time. How to heal the argument or how to heal the disagreement or whatever is yes. happening in between you and the other right, person. Right. Which involves taking accountability for what your behavior has done. Yeah. It, one of the worst ways to do that is say, well, I would have done it had you not done, right? If you say, well, I would have, I wouldn't have said this if you not said that. Right. No, and then you don't need to, once you start tallying who did what, you're, you're already in a losing situation. The, the, the correct response is, I'm sorry that I said this, I could have done better. And that, ex, that acknowledgement of, I shouldn't have said that, I didn't mean that, I'm going to do better. Just that little promise says, I'm, I'm wanting to heal this rather than, uh, go, go Just kick curious. rocks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. You know, it sounds like something that that type of language sounds like something that would work really well in an intimate relationship, a partner, uh, you know, in a marriage, if people spoke like that, Hey, I didn't mean it like that. I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm sorry if that hurt you. Right. That's not what I really meant. Yes. I'm sure that would help heal and mend arguments and disagreements in a beautiful, loving way. Yeah. I'm curious from your experience, you've been married 11 years now, is that correct? 11, yeah. You've been doing trial law for how long? Eight. Eight years. Okay, so. Uh, you, yeah, about 10, 10 years, yeah. Roughly about the same time. Yeah. What is the number one skill you bring to trial law? that you aren't as good in marriage and relationships? And what is the number one thing you do well in your marriage that you wish you did better in trial law? Mm. In the first scenario of what do I do well at court that I don't do well at home? Or not as well. Yeah, and not as well. Manage my emotions. You manage emotions really well at court. Yes, you have to. I can't, I can't be, I can't be acting a fool. Right. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? Like there's too, there's too much, there's too much at stake and, and you're, you're as a profession, that's, that's not a place to be doing that it, versus at home. Yeah. I get mad about, I mean, all kinds of things. Really? Yeah. I mean, we, we, I'm human. I mean, but of course I'm not somebody who lashes out. I'm not, I'm not a big emotionally reactive uh, person. I'm, I'm pretty much like this. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that. The fifth time, I, you know, my son's asked me to, uh, for a popsicle, that it's, no, man, it's after bedtime. We've already eaten one a day. It's, it's time to go I've to bed. I've already said no. Yeah, yeah. We've, I've already said no. And like, you just, it's easy to uh, try and get that. So dealing with those emotions, and I, I also think a lot of that is home is a safe place to express and feel your emotions. Right. Versus in the workplace. Not so much. You may not succeed as well you got in it. your career or accelerate your not career. Not mine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, if you are. Because if you're always emotionally reactive in my profession, you're just seen as a hothead and somebody that nobody can work with. Not credible. No, yeah. not, not credible. On the flip side of it, what do I do well at home that I don't do nearly as well in the in the workplace? Man, that's, that's hard. I feel like what we do really well at home is sometimes have like very direct, fast arguments. And my wife's also an attorney. Oh man. Yeah. yeah, yeah so you yeah, both yeah, got your case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both. So, but our arguments are extremely efficient. Like they, I, I can't, I can count on one hand the amount of times they've actually been like long. Really? Yeah. And it's typically pretty, pretty quick. How do you, how do you create quick arguments? How do you end arguments quickly? Quick apologies. Really? And you both apologize fast? Yes, but but we will kind of package it. We, it's not like we have a formula or like, let's go to the book. No, right. it's not. <laughs> this is what we've like developed over time is uh, when I heard you say this, it made me think this. I didn't mean that. Okay. Well, I'll, I will, next time I'll try to ask you this before I go there. I won't make an assumption. Yeah. I won't get upset right away without asking you further. Yeah interrogations yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got it oh 
yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I'll hear like, stop cross examining. <laughs> like she she can pick it up immediately. And I don't mean to do it. She, yeah. It's just happening. But sure. Yeah. She'll, okay. She quickly shuts that down. What is a, a top strategy or technique that you've learned ethically to get what you want from people, to persuade, influence, and enroll others, strangers or people you know very well, in getting something you want? You have to give them a reason to want to give it to you. And it needs to come from a place of making them happy to do so. And when it becomes a, a place of rather a negotiation, which makes them feel like they've lost something, you couch it and frame it in a way that feels like they've gained something. And so if you and I are across the table in a negotiation, whatever you give, you've lost. But if I can say, you know what, Lewis, man, you've just been doing so well. You hit three million on and YouTube now. I mean, your stuff's just going off the charts. You know what you could be really good at and I'd love to see is X, Y, and Z. And all of a sudden it's like a shift of you're sitting on the same t side of the table as me. And now I'm trying to help you inspire other thoughts that are also aligned with what I want. And that's a much, now you're going to say, oh, that sounds sneaky. Uh, no, it's it's not. It's actually getting what you, you need sometimes yeah. in a way that is also benefiting the other person. Right. I'd much rather that way than say, I don't like you. You don't like me. We're just going to have a bloodbath and have at it. Sure. May the, may the best guy win. Right, right. Yeah. You know? So just don't ask for a, a uh, arm wrestle right now. You're, you're going to win that one. <laughs> <laughs> when you go into a negotiation, you know you're about to negotiate something. Yeah. What is the best intention you should have going into it so that you can create the best outcome for you and the other person still feels like they didn't lose? The So Chris Foss's book is fantastic, Never Split the Difference. And one of the things about tactical empathy is making the other person feel like you're, you want the best for them, that you're, that you're in their camp. And you're not going to get emotionally reactive in the in the answer. You're you you're already addressing the issues that you're expecting them to to think of. So, like he'll say, you're probably thinking that X, Y, and Z. You're, you, it sounds to me like he's already kind of given these hints of what he's already picking up on. And when you say what already they are thinking in their mind, you pull it out on the table really quickly, and then and then and then that's it. What I will do a lot of the times is somebody gives some kind of objection, not like in the legal sense in a courtroom, but I'll say, aside from that, aside from what you just said, anything else that I should know about? And they say, no, great. And then I'll typically give it like a two path thing. So I will, I will ask more questions. See, typically when I hear that, some, it means that they really don't want to talk to me and that's, that's okay if you're not ready to right now. If there's some, they actually do want to talk about, they're not sure what they want to say. Is it really one or two for you? And then you be able to kind of delve for that. But it's inviting them into a way that it's going to get you what you want at the end. Right, right. That's interesting. Yeah. And how do you build confidence in conversations with people that are difficult, that are smarter than you, potentially, uh, that are older than you? How do you create confidence in challenging conversations to make sure that you're on the same play field with the other person and you get the results you want in the conversation, whether it's just a conversation or a negotiation. One would be to do not let defensiveness be your first step. As soon as you take that step, you've lost. The better way to do it is let your breath be the first word that you say. So if you think of your breath as a word, it kind of changes your mind of, okay, now I can address this because we'll, what we'll do is we'll hold our breath like that. And then, I mean, you, you know, this thing kicks in our nerves, then, then, then comes in the adrenaline, then yeah. comes in the defensiveness and you realized I haven't even breathed yet, <laughs> you know? And, um, and when it comes to, to, to confidence, of course we can say it's the way you project, it's the way you smile, it's the way you pace your conversation, keeping your voice low keeping your words slow. It's all these kind of things is the perception that I don't have to say anything more than what I need to say. 
because oftentimes more words says less. You need to eliminate that. Right, right. Less words says more. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, every time. What's it been like over the last year? You were a trial lawyer for seven, eight years, you know, small town, Texas, and, uh, you know, living your life, kids, married, and then all of a sudden you say, you know what, I think I'm going to share some of these things on yeah. social media, you know, essentially a year, year and a half ago. And um, even the last year and a half, it's gone from a couple of videos here and there to over 5 million followers. Right. And people really coming to you for wisdom and advice. And, you know, now your business growing, your law firm growing, and opportunities coming to you. Right. What has that experience done for you and your confidence and also your personal life? And do you feel more stressed or overwhelmed or a sense of pressure now that you have this larger following and people looking to you for advice? Yes, it has helped my law firm in a big way because I don't tell people what I do, but they're interested in it. And so they go and find me. Now, sometimes I'll just get calls for people who just want to talk. Sure. Or people who will act like they're a client just so, just so they can talk. But by and large, it's, it's been very helpful for, for my business. And it's always helpful for my trials. I have, I have several trial settings this this fall. There's not a judge who hasn't seen the videos. There's not a really? opposing counsel who hasn't seen the videos. And so it's, it's good and bad because it makes me very hyper aware of my interactions with them. Because as soon as I say one thing that's off, then oh, Jefferson's not who he, um, who he is, which is just not true. But I would say absolutely it's built a lot more pressure. Really? And yeah. Yeah, that's the, I think it was one of the sources of the, when I had a, my first panic attack at the beginning of this year. Uh, because even though you have more followers, it's also very isolating in a way because I know law very well. And when I had that, I had a lot of people at my table, so to speak. I had mentors, I had friends, I had other people who, who I mean, other lawyers, I had my, my family, I had studied it. I knew, I'd read all the things. And it started out awesome. The social media thing was, I, I, I just going in my car for a little bit and make, making a video of what was off the top of my head. And now it's gotten much more serious. And with that, there's a pressure of not wanting to give bad advice. I'm certainly never going to act like I know everything. I can, of course, I can give bad advice. I, I mean, it's, it's inevitable. So you have that kind of feeling and it's a lot of eyes on you. So with anybody, it's kind of that, imposter syndrome like do i really know what i'm saying you know it is do i really do i really know it or i'm just fooling everybody wow and so you kind of have to to battle that in your head and go no nope I, i've done this i've done this like when i say done like i've lived this i've lived that although this has been my life yes and as long as i share my life and i'm authentic to who i am i'm never going to be an imposter right because you started opening up recently and did some different videos about the you know kind of mental health uh panic attacks yeah. that you've experienced when did you have the first panic attack how did that make you feel and how have you been able to manage that feeling of overwhelm or you know panic it was in february where all of a sudden i had a whole bunch of videos that were taken off videos that i had posted like two weeks prior going viral you got it yeah I had like four of them all in a row and it was me going i don't know what's happening Somebody at Instagram messed up, like I, you know, like the, I was like this, this can be. And as it continued to grow, then I started seeing more people with. I didn't have a blue check. It's all these more people with a blue check following me. Um, and that was before you could buy it. And then I'm seeing you know um, other celebrities, and I'm going hold up here. Uh, what what's happening? And then I knew I needed to get like build a website because I didn't have a website. So I'm staying up super late, like working on some Put something together. Yeah, just yeah. anything, any anything. There's no team. It's just it's just this guy. And it was a little after midnight. Wife, kids were asleep, and Lewis. It felt like somebody had gotten that little piece of paper and just wafted it in front of my face, like a very cool just rush. And I said out loud in the kitchen, "I said, what was that?" Because I was like, is this a ghost just, you know, jump over me? And 
just like that. It was gun, 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 gun. I just, all of a sudden I could hear it in my ears, tightness in my chest and my whole system just started to like freak. I was really? convinced, I was convinced that was a heart attack and I was dying. Holy cow. Because I knew it could not have been anxiety. Really? Why? You, because, you, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, I, I, I stressed cool. for breakfast. Yeah, I'm chill. I, I'm you, cool. know, you know what I mean? Trials I've had, you know, me stressful situations and money on the line and all this stuff. I, I, I eat stress. We can do this. I, I was, it, it was such an ignorant mindset, but at the moment I was like, you thought you were having a heart attack. I thought I was having a heart attack because there could be no other explanation in my mind because I don't have anxiety. I don't have panic attack. The, that's for people who don't have their life together. That was the, that was the very wrong mindset that I and had. What happened during that night and how did you get through it? Oh, well, I went to the ER because I thought I was dying. Wow. And did you drive yourself? Did your wife drive you? Did you call 911? I called 911. Yeah. The ambulance came ambulance to pick came. you up, mm -hmm. the whole thing, both the thing. lights, sirens. The whole thing, dude. They bring out the. Oh, yeah. The I, was, I was shaking so badly, like uncontrollable shaking. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what was going on. All I knew was like, all I could tell my wife is something is not right. Like, that's all I could get out of my mouth. Something is not right. It's true. Something was not right. right. My body's like, no. Your nothing. body was convulsing. Yeah, yeah my body was like, yeah, you're not right right now. It was like shutting down. Yeah. The system powered down. Yeah, or... all of that. Holy was, cow. It, yeah, it, at 34 is the first time I've ever had that kind of experience. It was very real. I mean, as physical and tangible as, as Heart candy. pounding. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so- Sweating, we, dizziness, oh, all uh, of it. I couldn't tell if I was going to throw it. I, like, I, was, I was like, Lord, anytime, please, because I hated- the, the whole thing, it just felt like it was days while you're just shaking. So I get down to the hospital. They run my blood work. By that time, I'm having like what you would call, I guess, aftershocks. Like I'd, I'd be good and then I'd have another just like onset. And then like kind go of intense off. heart yeah. palpitations. And then or... it'd go flat. And then I just like everything in my body would like clinch up. It just, and that happened for, I, I don't know, two hours or so. And then they just said, well, you just, no heart attack. Your heart's good. Yeah, your blood works fine. Blood started, Everything was healthy, fine. Healthy, healthy as can be. But you just you had a had a panic attack, and I was like, "Excuse me, what?" And like you had a panic attack. I was like, uh, "No, I'm sure yeah, my heart yeah, had a." Yeah, yeah, I was like, I was like, uh, "Are you sure? You just it's okay. I'll get a heart monitor. It's okay." Uh, but yeah, so that panic attack. Panic and when attack. they said that, how did they make you feel? It made me feel very normal and 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 messed up. It made me feel like I was something was wrong with me. Like it made me feel like, uh, oh no, I am now I'm one of them. Like now I'm now I'm somebody who can't control my thoughts. Now I'm somebody who like now I am going. And then it, like the panic of the thoughts. So some of those thoughts in the my panic mind, of the panic attack. You got it, yeah. And, and and because in that moment, yeah, I can tell myself, of course, no, you you're perfectly normal. Yes, you're supposed to have your body is. This is all natural. I could say that now. In that moment, it was. Well, what, what's, what's, what's happening and is my brain is falling apart because you would have these rapid thoughts that would come, these crazy thoughts that I could not stop. Like, and I'm like, what thoughts? Oh, you, uh, I'll, for whatever reason they would revolve around, like uh, for whatever reason, death was a trigger, like any thought of dying or the topic of it would just like send my whole body into a, a fritz. And that's so bizarre. Coming from never in my life has this happened. Ever. And here I am, the guy who is, at the time, is going, it was the night that my fallen hit a million. It was when it happened. Wow. The night you hit a million. The night in a million. And, but it was the thought of, here's this guy who gives all this communication advice about, you know, blah, blah. And I'm just rippling and I'm just melting. I had another panic attack for the next eight days. Every day. Every day. Did you call the ER every time or no? No, no, no. You I, knew this was happening. Yeah. The second time, the second time was at the office and I was like, oh no. I said, I was like, oh no. But at that point I knew I wasn't dying and that's a, that's a very big relief. How long did the second one last? Uh, just as long. Just as hours. Long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're sitting in the office for a couple hours, like laying down on the couch. Breathing. The I'm, I'm straight just like d pulling out the Headspace app. I'm working Holy. on my breathing. I'm like, Yeah. And so, and, and the next days after that, it was the same. They got a little bit shorter, but it would happen at terrible times. Wow, man. And yeah, it was terrible. It was a horrible time. And then um, I was like, man, I got to see what this is. I got to see what this is about. So I spent like a full day marked off my calendar of like, I am researching 
everything I want to know about this topic because never in my life had I been on our radar. What'd you find out about? What'd you, what'd you discover? So I discovered s- several things. One was part of that response that your body is going through. Your body is telling you things that something is not right. You're because I, I have a great mental game and you know, I can tell myself just about anything like, no, I'm not nervous. I'm excited. I, I'm, I'm very happy to be here or I'm prepared. I'm there someday. Yeah. You, you got, yeah. I have to have this mindset of calm, cool and collected when I walk in that door, when I walk through those courtroom doors, they need to, I need to look like, uh, I've already won. I just need to show them why. And, and here in this mindset was me saying, actually, uh, your body knows better than you do. You uh, can't outthink this. You got it. Yeah. Cannot think. You got to feel it. Yeah. And, and move through it. Yeah. There's that book. I can't remember the author. Body keeps the score. Yeah. And incredible. Book. Yeah. So I I ordered that book like right away. What did you learn about your yourself, your body, yeah. your memories of the past no, no, that no. were causing this? There was a sense of, and this is gonna it's gonna sound weird, but it's just, it was a sense of immediate isolation. Okay, I have a million on my phone. Between me and you, it's just a digit from a number on my phone. That's it. No different than if I just press one on a keypad on my calculator on my phone. But that number meant much more significance. And of course, there are a lot of creators that have way more than that. But for somebody who's just been in this car, who doesn't see any of these people, right. I'm in a small town. I'm, a, I'm growing law firm. I'm just doing all I can. And then all of a sudden, I felt like a lot of eyes were on me and I had nobody to help. Like there was nobody. I couldn't, if I called my best friend, he'd be like, yeah, I mean, uh, he doesn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh, that's, right. that's a, that's a bummer. You know, I, I just, they couldn't, they couldn't, I, I could tell, Hey, we do, what do you think? I don't know. I'm glad I reached out to you then. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Good topic. It really <laughs> was. I'm telling you, I, that's why I, I, I thank you immensely because that, that was just to have that, that presence yeah. is, um, to know that. I, if I need to, I can call or somebody who's kind of been yeah. through that, that change. And so now there's probably only four, maybe five people that I can ha- share everything with Yeah, that will actually not judge me, that will relate to it in some way that maybe has already had some type of experience like that, that will, you know, have compassion for me where if I said these things to other people or publicly or whatever it might be. People just want to understand or want to get it. And I'm not saying that. Or take it wrong. Or they might take it wrong. And I'm not saying that I have like some unique experience that's greater or better than others. It's just a different unique experience from a different position of life. And it's not a better, worse than, good, bad. It's just a different perspective. That's right. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, there's, there's only a few people that I can really fully just let loose with yeah but that's 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 smart i mean that's biblical the the keep your friends very close and few and the, your your true ones that right, right, love, right. You, love you no, no matter yeah, what i mean where i can say all the stuff the you got the it. messy the nasty the the unfiltered the unfiltered the stuff hurt, the raw yeah. the all oh, yeah all of that it and, was, and it's it would human beings need that at every stage of life yeah you know whether you're 14 and right dealing with stuff in your mind or some weird stuff or you're 40 yeah. you know yeah. we all need those people that we can have those conversations with yeah yeah at, at, at every at every stage at every level if, if you don't have that outlet your your body's going to carry it for you absolutely until it till it can't until it, anymore it's going to release in some yeah, way and, until it can and and that's that's what happened with me was just that that feeling of big time isolation i'd been there were more brands and diff, like you know, like people email you and call you and, uh, you need to Want go with this. From yes. You or... And, oh, we see this and you ought to do it. And so you're going, wait, man, look, I just, I got to get chicken nuggets in the oven right now. You know what I mean? Like, can, can you yeah, please? My, my yeah. kids crying over here. Right, Let me just right. deal like, with this. Yeah. Like I get home, it's, it's mayhem, it's bath time. It's, you know, you just, yeah, there's no, there's no team of anything beyond the guy in the car yet. But it was definitely that feeling of, I felt like my life was just like starting to just expand in a, in a very surreal way that my body felt despite what my brain was telling it. 
What did you realize about yourself from those eight days of panic attacks that you were holding on to, that you were resisting, or that you were not ready for yet? It was a sense of don't let them down. Like that was a- What, the number? Uh, the number yeah. of people watching or following? Yeah, because well, they'll comment, they message, they, they say incredibly nice, heartfelt things. I still get to read them. And they're just the kindest, yeah. kindest things that you go, I do not deserve to read what I just- Wow. Like, yeah, I mean, you just, you just feel like an immediate sense of uh, humility and- feel Like an imposter or something? N- not so much an imposter of a, don't let these people down because they really do depend on that, that advice for whatever reason. That daily cho- message you give they've them. They've chosen the guy in the car, in the driver's seat. They want to hear what his thoughts are on, on X, Y, and Z which I love. I truly do love it. And I hope I do it for the rest of my life. But it is in that moment, in the very first beginning of me saying, okay, this is happening. Like this is, this, I guess this is happening. That was a immediate sense of settling into that ex, that expectation. I also learned that I was getting a bad habit of holding my breath when I was working. Or doing things. So you weren't breathing as so your body was yeah, like. Yeah. And so I know I was, that feeling, man. Yeah. So I was reading, and that part of that panic attack is the same sensation you get when your body's drowning, is because I, I'm, I'm holding my breath, priving myself of oxygen, and my body is like kicking in. It's like, <sighs> yeah, you got it. It needs more oxygen. You got it. And so without me just thinking in the day, I was catching myself more and more holding my breath or shallow breathing or yes. various. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Barely breathing. Like, of course I'm alive, but it's like I'm holding it more than I'm letting it out and I'm not fully utilizing my body, which tells me that there's that tension, that like tightness. Yeah. So once I realized that I was holding my breath, that's what taught me of like, okay, well, let's let's fix that. Right. Because once I started fixing that, much, much, much better. Mm. Yeah. There's something I've learned over the years about, and I'm curious how you approach this. And I, I don't always get it right, and I don't always, it doesn't always work for me, but a psychological strategy. When someone is, quote unquote, attacking me, or is saying nasty things about me that I don't believe are true, or maybe it's just, I don't like the way they're saying it, and I don't want it to penetrate yeah. my heart and yes. my soul. Yeah. And be reactive and defensive right. and uh, right, right. Yeah. rigid yeah, yeah. and frustrated and de- all these things. When the, when, the, when the brow goes like this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One of the psychological or therapeutic uh, strategies that I've learned is to imagine either a, a field, an energetic field around me that I can see it, but then it bounces off. Okay. The words, the yeah. intention, the yeah. energy, it comes and then boink, it just goes around me. And right. It, like water off a duck. I feel like there's right? a Star Wars reference, but yes, yeah, that's exactly. exactly right. Yeah. Or what I'll do is I will separate the ego from the self and I'll have the ego over here next to me psychologically. Yeah. And an image of it, the ego of me here. Yeah. And I'll just say, oh, they're just speaking to the ego. Yeah. And the detachment. They're just, oh, they're speaking over here. Right. And they're actually speaking to me. Yeah. They might be looking at me, but it's just we're redirecting right. right here. Right. And, Oh, this doesn't affect me. Yeah, they're talking oh, to just, that guy. Yeah. And I saw, um, I think I saw, I think it was Selma Hayek one time talk about this. Um, and she was giving an example somewhere, a line about how, you know, if someone spoke to you really poorly in Spanish and you don't speak Spanish, you're not going to get defensive. Right. You're just going to be like, well, okay, I have no <laughs> clue what this crazy person yeah. is saying to me. Um, okay, so just act like it's a different language. Right. You know, these just different ways of like separating yourself from yeah, the hurt I like that too. or the the potential pain. Yes. What have you learned to support yourself psychologically and emotionally and spiritually? Yeah. When this feeling of panic, or stress comes your way, or when potential attacks come your way emotionally. So, very similar to yours, I, in my mind, I visually have a trash can next. To me. Oh, okay. All right. And I can see it. It's one of those big, huge gallon ones. Yeah. It's the black, sure. shiny. It's, Open yeah, it up, you got but, it. Yeah. yeah. And I see what they're, they're saying is just a shoot. So I can see the words coming. 
and I'm sifting uh, because the issue they're telling me is not the real issue. And so if I hear something that's uh, offensive, that's not nice, I just, okay, that's trash. Let me just, I'm just, I, in my mind, I grab it with my right hand, lift up and throw wow. it. Wow. Like that's, that's, that's cool. what I'll do with my, with my thoughts. And I'm sifting to where if they might have led with something that was snarky, which our inclination is to grab onto that yeah, and send it back to it. Yeah. yeah, send it back and be like, oh, I just, I got a good one coming. Instead, <laughs> Zing, yeah, yeah, you got it. Instead, if I throw that one away, if I just trash it, and then I found the one word that they said at the very end, towards the end, and that was, that was the one word. And then if I focus on that word, then it all starts to kind of crumble. But that's, I just imagine a trash can. Wow, it's interesting. Now, how do you not, how do you communicate your worth when someone is being offensive or adding a little digs underneath their language? Maybe they're trying to get a message across um, and they're frustrated. So they're saying a few things that would be offensive to you potentially or maybe hurt you or maybe kind of put you beneath. Yeah. How do you create a boundary consciously with them so that they don't keep doing that? in the future where it's letting them know, Hey, this, this type of communication doesn't really work for me. It's not okay. And, and owning your worth. Yeah. While also being able to throw it away at the same time and not let it get to you. Like, how do you navigate that so that they, that doesn't continue to happen in friendships or yeah. in relationships or in career right? where that doesn't continue? Like, I understand we can do it once or twice yeah. or three times, but if someone's always doing that to us, right? how do we create create that boundary and, and cautiously communicate our worth. Depending on the context of like who that person is, you know, who, who they are in your life. So some people you just can't get away from, I mean, or family members, what have you, but it's a balance of your value and then w what we're going to just call as what I'm interested in. So if somebody were going to say something that's offensive in a way and they are pushing me, it's a much more powerful move. I'm very dominant assertive move to say, I'm not interested in returning what you just gave. Oh, wow. That's a, it's a power move. Yeah. Oh yeah. And see, it's, it, so if I say Jefferson, you know, it was pretty idiotic what you did the other day to me and I, I just didn't, you know, yeah, you just looked like an idiot, but I, what I really want to do is, is I want, moving forward, I want us to go do this thing instead. Right. Or whenever I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. How would you respond to something like, like that? So if somebody, well, what you kind of did was you, you like hit it into something else that they did. So what I, f I would first do is call that out. Uh, say, no, I, 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 I hear two points. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like, I'm not going to skip that. So okay. I'll say, so you want to, you want to just throw the trash away right away. You got it. You well, address it. Well, because they're trying to hide the trash in the good. Yeah. And so I, my response is, well, I see two different things. So that first point. I don't have an interest in responding to whatever, or I'm going to say, well, maybe I did look like an idiot, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be holding on to whatever message you're trying to, right. to send to me. But it, it's a, it's much more dominant move to say, I have no interest in returning what you're sending. Right. I have no interest in calling you what I saw yesterday. You do or something like that. I'm you like, got it. it. But if you use the phrase, I have no interest. I have no interest in in talking about your opinion of my performance. Oh, interesting. You know what I mean? Like, it's uh, obviously that's not something you want to start off with because that could sound that could sound defensive. That can sound issues. But the point of it is, when you say I have no interest, you're letting them know I don't have an. In it's like you're saying that as you're doing the trash can thing. I really don't have an interest in, you know, this this kind of food. It's not great for me. Doesn't really settle well with me, but what does taste good of what you said, you know, about X, Y, and Z. And so you kind of imagine those words as part of, let's say it's kind of, you know, your diet. Sorry, I'm a little lactose intolerant, but right. So let's, let's skip the milk and talk about something else. What are the three power moves in conversations that really set you up for success in any conversation? Number one is silence. Just nothing. So if somebody were to say something that's snarky, 
the best move is to say nothing. You just kind of sit back and you look around, you look up, you look off. I'm telling you, nine times out of 10, they can't take it. Really? They can't take that silence because then, then it's spread out. You've just exposed. Instead of you covering it up with something else that says, excuse me, did, what did you say? You're just leaving it open. Um, Can you like, that, that really was that the best foot you're gonna wow. put out right now? You got that one? one? You go, that's the one you're, we're gonna choose. And if you just let that silence sit there, oftentimes, and you probably heard this, they go, I shouldn't have said that. You, you gotta give them that chance. That's number one. Yeah, number one is you gotta, you gotta give them the chance of, of that silence. Number two, Acknowledge that it could be without acknowledging that it is. And you say, example of saying, well, maybe so. Maybe you're right. Did not say you're right. No. Nope. But maybe you are. Maybe, maybe you're right. But it's that piece of humility that says, yeah, well, maybe you're right. Mm. I had a guy once who said, uh, I was deposing him and, you know, all these, all you lawyers, worst things that ever happened to America kind of talk. And I said, well, Maybe you're right, but today's just going to be a conversation between us. Mm. Is it okay if you're just talking to Jefferson? And he said, yeah, I can do that. Wow. And so it's that ability to just say, well, maybe so, but I could have, I could have gotten really defensive with him. I could have, I could have chosen to take him that personally instead. I just dropped it. Uh, the other power, other power move is to hold off on the timing. So when you are mad that's generally not the best time to do it when like when when you know you've done something wrong and you want somebody to be mad at you to like fight me please like i know i've done something wrong i let's let's have this out we'll talk about this Can you got you, you want to talk about this at noon right, right. Let's, let's talk let's, about let's, it. let's put it in the calendar for tomorrow you got it let's yeah. oh, oh well i'm okay and it's well, I'm, <laughs> I'm i'm glad i'm glad you said that well then you know, I don't really have my thoughts together on that, but mm. why don't we kind of wanted to talk about that at, at noon tomorrow? What, what do you think? Now they're like, oh my God, like yeah, I, just, yeah. I just said something that I shouldn't have <laughs> said, but that's, that's a much better way of, of, uh, of handling it because at, at that point you have not lost any confidence. Right. You have not lost your credibility and you just, you, you've maintained that you're the one in control at all times. And I'm telling you, the key is just starting with your breath. Mm. And choosing to be quiet, right? And if you were to if you were to say something to me, and I responded right away, like if you were to say, um, I don't know, do you do you um, do you enjoy matcha tea? And I go no. Versus me thinking, no, like there's just a different connotation to it sure. when you when you think about it. Yeah, um, about fourteen years ago. Um, someone gave me a, a line that became one of the most powerful uses of language over the last 14 years to help me get almost anything I want or more of what I already have. And I use it all the time when I go, uh, order a coffee, I use it. When I go to a hotel and try to get an upgrade, I use it when I'm working with uh, partners and collaborators, I use it. And the line is, what's the chance? What's the chance you can give me a discount on this? What's the chance you can give me an upgrade in this hotel room? Yeah, I love what's it. What's the chance you can get me in first class? Yeah. What's the chance we can collaborate in a bigger way? Yeah. What's the chance you can go a little more on this? And I've used that over and over again because it continues to work. And I almost use it as a game daily. Yeah. Like any store I go into, I'm just like, what's the chance you got 10% off on this? Yeah. Just to see what if you can make something happen. Yeah. Because if you don't ask, you're not going to get it. Right. And um, it's just like a way to be playful. It's a way to like, see, can I enroll someone in something that I maybe I shouldn't be getting, I but like I'm going to get. Yes. And it often works where the unexpected happens. Is there another line of communication that you use, maybe even unknowingly, that yeah. you use consistently that seems to just help you enroll people in more of what you want? So I do, I absolutely use the, 
what's the chance? Really? Yeah. So I, I will use that when it feels like a surface, <laughs> like a stalemate between oh, the man. other attorney. And now look, what's the chance that your client's going to be able to do X, Y, and Z? Also, I will try to separate the attorney from the client. Same way I do with like the reception clerk versus the hotel. I, I, I make sure that I acknowledge them as the person because I acknowledge their struggle of what they're going through. Right. And so if I talk to the attorney of, look, I can only imagine, you know, all the updates you're, you're having to do or all the work you're putting through. I, I know that this is how you're doing the best thing you can for your client. I mean, between me and you, what, what, what's the chance that we can do X, Y, and Z? Or if I were to do, or if I were to say, or if my client were, if I were to encourage my client to do this, is that something that I should do? And it gives them a, something to think about. Right. The same way, like at a, let's say at a hotel or something like that, I, I can only imagine you just been, how, how long's your shift? Yeah. Yeah, seven hours. And I'm like, gosh, yeah, that's going to be. And so you just, yeah, you kind of create that connection with them that says, I'm talking to you individually as a person rather than seeing you as the whole. And then, because that's who they are. Yeah, exactly. That's powerful. I wanted to go back to the uh, the panic attacks for a moment. Um, does it sound like you you really studied and researched a lot on how you could manage and 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 have a better relationship with the anxiety or the stress that you were having for those eight days? Have you had more panic attacks since the moment? They've gotten less and less and less. Less and less. Uh, like because five ten minutes at a time or something. Yeah. So uh, well, I haven't had. I probably haven't had a panic attack. I've gotten very close probably in the last like three weeks, but what it is, is like a sense of boiling water. Like I can feel the water boiling and then I have my, and I can feel it in my body. Like I can feel it in my fingers of like, like tingly. Yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Or I'm typically never somebody to shake my leg, but if all of a sudden my leg is shaking, then I'm like, okay, something's up. And that all, like, that'll tell me right away of, all right, what, what, what are we doing? What's going on? be able to kind of check in with myself and and how that's been but it's it's progressed much better. better yeah it, it really has therapy helps yeah and i in the that was really the source was not feeling alone in this kind of ecosystem that i didn't ask for like that this is never my goal of like if i can only get so many followers yeah, yeah it was like a let's just go i don't know i got a few minutes like go talk to my phone <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. What is the, what has the relationship been like with your wife and your kids since experiencing the rise of your audience, but also the stress and, and panic that you've experienced over the last six months? How has your wife shown up for you? And, and how has it made you relate to your family differently? Well, but having kids has made me much more just empathetic as a, as a person and I'll tell you that it's, it is a way that we relate to each other is when I see them start to get really emotional, I can see myself in it. Yeah, my son looks a lot like me. And so like I can, it's very much this kind of weird inner child like dialogue. Wow. Like I'm telling them things that I wish I could have, oh, I, I would have been told at, you know, hey man, it's okay to cry. Wow. Just let it out. Let it out. Not, you know, I was never told that, but I went and. I'm not going to make that mistake. And so my son is extremely waterworks all the time. And I love it. I mean, he's emotional in movies. I love it. And I, I was, and so I, to, to see that where I go, no, 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 I've, I've, I've had that mistake of trying to put on this Jefferson's got it all together. This mask. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. This, I got it all. I got it all together. It's, it's, it, you were. Just let it out, man. Wow. It's, it's all good. It's all good. And he will. He'll just cry. Say, I can't help it. And I'll say, you don't need to. You're he's good, man. You're good. He's he's very, both of my kids are, are extremely um, empathetic with with movies. Mm. Um, I, I shared something before of, this was like not that long ago. And my son says, how your day was that? It was good, buddy. We, it was, it was, it was good. And he was like, what, what'd you do? I was like, well, it was, it was just good. It was a good day. It was fine. Truthfully, it was not good. Mm. Like it was, it was a really horrible 
it was a rough day. It was yeah, a rough yeah. day. I was tired. And later on that evening, he came up to me again. And he said, so why did you tell me your day was good when it wasn't? Wow. I said, what? He said, you didn't, he said, you said it was good, but it didn't, you didn't say it like it was good. I was like, how did you, how did you know? He's like, you said it like it wasn't good. You wow. said it like it was bad. They feel I, everything. You, yes. And I was like, how are you this young? And like, he had already sensed it. Like he told me he was good. He wasn't. Wow. And so that, that kind of aspect of it, when you say, how's my wife showing up for me? She's allowed me to have the time to kind of explore, hey, you need to make sure you're taking care of yourself. And she's awesome at su- supporting anything that I'm after. And we support both of our careers. She has a full-time career. It's her doing her thing in, in, in school and school law. And I have my, my legal career. And in terms of the social media stuff, it doesn't affect anything. Like, it, it could you could call it Finstagram. Like, nobody right, at right. my house. It doesn't exist at my house. It's just uh, your dad, mom, kids. Right. Mayhem. Right. That's all, that's all it is. Now, she's very supportive of it, and they know that every once in a while, dad will make a video. Sure. So, because they want to make videos. I'm curious, with your upbringing, which sounds like you had a great upbringing, but also things that maybe you wish you would have had or experienced in certain ways from parents or life, and with what you're experiencing now from, you know, building your career, getting married at a young age yeah. in today's society, and, and now having this kind of following and presence, what are three lessons, if you could only teach three lessons to your kids right now, what would those three lessons be that you wish you would have known growing up or that you did know and you want them to know? One would be always be authentic to who you are personally. Don't ever try to be anybody else than, than who you are. I can tell you that anytime I felt like I've needed to be somebody else, it was the wrong call every time that I tried to be either more or less than just exactly who I am. You know, I, I see it as just a floor in an elevator. It doesn't mean it's a better floor or not. It just you need to be exactly where you're, you're meant to sure. be. Two is it's okay to to feel like there are, it's okay to make mistakes. I grew up in a house where it was very, it was a lot of it, I'll admit, let's put on myself expectations of being the best at everything you sure, could, sure. You could be at, at whatever it was. I just enjoyed it. And, but the understanding that they don't have to put that pressure on, on, on themselves. And, and number three is be kind to everybody. Kindness, kindness never, it never changes. People value it now. They, they always, they always have. We could talk for hours, man, but I want to wrap things up here in a few minutes. Um, Jefferson underscore Fisher on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, all, all over social media, you can find you. I'll have everything linked up there. Oh, cool. Thanks. You've got a, you've got a book you're working on that we'll probably have you back on in the future when that comes out. But I want people to follow you on Instagram, TikTok, yeah. Facebook, all the places. Hopefully we'll get you on YouTube soon. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you do a daily video, man. Your video, I mean, almost every day, it seems like it's like every day you're yeah. giving wisdom, you're giving inspiration from daily lessons and law and your experience and life and right it's really inspiring to see you create from a place of generosity from a place of service so i want to acknowledge you for the consistency and i also want to acknowledge you for opening up about the panics that you've experienced that was hard and being vulnerable with your community and saying hey listen guys this is something i've never experienced and you know i love having this community but also i feel this sense of pressure and this overwhelm that i've never experienced in my life and and I think it's powerful to be talking about it because what we keep hidden and right. we hide continues to manifest and hurt us you got it. and stress us. So the fact that you're talking about it is probably allowing you to release some. It really is. And relax some. Yeah. I'm not saying it's going to solve every issue you have mentally or emotionally, but right. it's allowing you to set yourself free. So I acknowledge you for not having it all put together not saying the perfect thing every time and allowing yourself to express how you feel, which sounds like is what your body needs. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very well put. Yeah. So I acknowledge you for that. Um, it's interesting. There's a question I ask a lot of people. I've got 
two final questions for you. But before I ask those, there's a question I ask a lot of people on here who rise to success or audience growth quickly within a period of time of seeming overnight or months or a year, right? Where they get this big audience. And I asked this question, I'm just curious because I want people to listen and hear the response. So if you could go back before you posted your first Instagram video a year and a half ago, or whenever it was, or when you did it and you didn't have that many followers, mm -hmm. if you could go back and ask yourself on a scale of one to 10, how much inner peace and self-love you had for yourself, 10 being a very high level in a humble way, one being zero peace, all chaos and stress inside of you. Mm -hmm. Where were you on a scale of one to 10 before the rise of social media success? 10 being very peaceful internally and calm and confident and less stress and one being chaos. I would probably say I was a, I was a solid eight. There was a sense of, you sure you want to put yourself on a phone? And in your car, you know, friends are going to see this, right? Right. And like, I'm not worried about strangers. Sure. You're worried about your friends. Sure. You know, it's, it's easy. You could have all these followers who you really care about. Sometimes they wait, my, my friend saw this and they didn't, they don't like they it. Didn't yeah. like what it. do they think about me? You, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's much easier to get in your head about the people sure. that are in your circle. Sure. Than the people that are outside. So you're a solid eight. Yeah. Before you started doing all this. Yeah. And then where would you say you currently are, uh, you know, for the last few months consistently? Yeah, uh, how I've been, I, I would say I'm a nine right now. So you have more peace and more, more self-love. Really? Yeah, well, it had it not been for what I went through at the beginning of this year, okay. the anxiety. Interesting. Because it's made me, it's really made me hug myself in a way. Oh, it's just and And to, because I, w I would get myself in a place of, I, I've always been pretty good at, Okay, I'll do a video and they'll either like it or they won't, I guess, you know, and you just go into the house and you live life. But it is a different aspect here of, I very much feel that, that I am cultivating a community of like-minded people that, I mean, when I posted that video of explaining about my anxiety, that was a very difficult video for me to even get out. It's a very difficult video for me to even watch, but the like outpouring of love that came from that was just, now it feels like I have a lot more, it's weird, I feel more connected to them in a way yeah. than, than I did before. Well, vulnerability breeds connection. So yeah, you were opening that's, that's in a true. different way. Yeah. Where were you on that scale, you know, in the beginning of the year when you were experiencing that month of panic? I, I was a two, man. Yeah. Yeah, it was not, it was not good. From from when it first started <laughs> sure. to about the time right before the panic attack, yeah, it was, yeah. I, I had fallen far. This is, you know, and this is what I want people to, to understand because there's a lot of people that want to have more success, more followers, mm -hmm. more financial opportunities, more things coming their way. And I don't know anyone, maybe one person was happier and more peaceful a year or two after the the big success came yes. quickly, right? They were always a couple below what they were right before the press came, the opportunities came, as they hadn't learned yet how to manage and navigate it. It sounds yeah. like you're learning now how to navigate it, where you feel peaceful, confident, right. calm. But had I not, I'd be right there with them and just trying to keep your head above water, yeah. right? And it and it always shocks me. I guess it shouldn't shock me anymore now. But most of us are not prepared emotionally or psychologically for audience growth that quickly, for financial growth that quickly. Although we think we want certain things, yeah, but we may not be emotionally, mentally, or physically ready right. for this psychological pressure, which is what it sounds like you had. This pressure of this, now I have this audience, I have to make sure I deliver and don't, don't yeah. give them the wrong information. What if, what if, what if I let them down? Right. This yeah. pressure which you can't really get away from unless you stop posting. Yeah, unless you just stop. Yeah. I, I, this was not something I sought out to do. It was like, I'm going to be an influencer, doggone it. No, it was like, a, I, I'm just going to make a video and let's see how- Try to help a few people. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's try. What do I like talking about? And that was the thing was I did it because I like talking about it. 
And if they like listening, I guess they'll listen. And then I asked people to follow me. At the end of it, turns out they did it. And then it was just like a whole different, uh, whole different ball game where all of a sudden you look around and go, wait, now if I, com- <laughs> if I compare this to the, the size of my current city and my town that I'm in. <laughs> this is like 50 know? times the size of yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's not even, yeah, not even close. So right, it's, right. It's, uh, that becomes, and then I had a buddy of mine who was like, oh, well, you know, you have X amount of followers. That's like X amount of state, like Dallas Cowboy Stadium or something. And I was like, why would you tell me that? <laughs> like, <laughs> it was the first thing that kind of came sure, out. Sure, sure. But it's like you said, absolutely. You, I was not emotionally prepared on, on that level for that amount of eyes, that amount of pressure. And it wasn't until that my body literally shut down. Wow. That said, now we gotta, we gotta wake up and make sure you're taking care of yourself because that, that two you were at was quickly starting to go into the negative. Exactly. And that's where real bad stuff happens. Big time. Yeah. If you don't address it. So. I acknowledge you, man, for, for doing the work and for continually doing it because it's healing is a journey. Yeah. And so much. I'm, I'm glad you're on that journey and feel free to reach out anytime you want I, some support or just yeah, a chat. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it, it's meant so much that you've, that you've been here. That, for sure. That, man. That, that, that means a lot to me. For sure, man. This is a question I ask everyone towards the end called the three truths. So imagine you get to live as long as you want, but it's your last day on earth. You get to accomplish all the dreams and experiences you want to have. But for whatever reason, all of your material, your content, your videos, the books you make, all these things, they have to go to the next place with you or they're no longer in this world. Yeah. This conversation is gone. But it's your last day on earth and you get to leave behind three truths, three lessons you would share with the world. And this is all we have to remember your wisdom by. What would be those three truths or lessons for you? Number one is the best piece of advice I received from my grandfather, who was an old East Texas attorney. He said, boy, you can't look back and plow a straight row. That's always stuck with me. Meaning encouraging people to, to be in the moment, in the present. If you look at what you're doing rather than looking for the next worry, your, your head's always gonna be in the, 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 right, the right place. Number two is you treat people how you wanna be treated. Just that, that very basic golden rule that we've all heard, but sometimes it's the things we've heard the most that we really have soaked up the least. And too many times that uh, I've, you know, we skip over it. And number three would be that at any time that you can show person kindness because you, you'll never regret it. There's so many things that I feel like generation generationally in, in our existence that we just got wrong it wasn't our fault we just weren't ready like we thought medicine was something different versus what we think medicine is now or you look at how we handle punishment or entertainment I mean, versus now but like kindness is it's not affected from inflation or recession or right. it doesn't depreciate a kindness of, little kindness can invaluable I love it. Those are great truths, man. Final question, Jefferson, what's your definition of greatness? Greatness is being able to show up for who you are in every level and every stage that, you, that you're meant to be in a way that spreads joy to everybody that you touch. Curiosity is an anti-fragile characteristic. Mm. And curiosity is a highly positive frame of mind. Curiosity is highly positive. There's all, every, everybody in all these different places talk about curiosity as an avenue to success for a variety of reasons pick up more, you're interested, you pay attention. The other person feels very connected with. 